All right. So good to see you guys. Hey, if you're joining us from home, it's good to see you too. We're awfully glad to have you. Uh, we're awfully thankful for the Supreme Court and them ruling in favor of our ability to meet. And so we're here celebrating uh, that today. Uh, I want to share with you uh, early in the week, even before that ruling came down, um, I was talking to Pastor Mike and I was telling him, you know, I know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm just not sure if it's daylight or, you know, a freight train coming towards us. And then I said, you know, I think when we finally do get to start meeting again, boy, I just kind of feel like it's going to be sort of like one of those morning after movies, like the morning after the alien invasion or the morning after the the asteroid, you know, and everybody's kind of kind of crawling out from the caves and like looking at the desolation and, you know, thinking about rebuilding. And I said, I feel, feel like that's going to be how we're going to sort of regather as a church for a while. And he said, well, Pastor Bill, I get that, but, and this really blessed me, and I think it's just, you know, Pastor Mike speaking with the wisdom beyond his age, but he said, you notice in those scenes that there's always a beautiful sunrise behind all of it. And I said, you know, that's, and so I know that it's going to be a rough few months or weeks, but uh, the sun is rising and God is doing a work and he's going to be faithful as people are feeling like they're able to come back and to be with us again. And in the meantime, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. Amen. So uh, kids, there is, I think, something for children's ministry today. And I know Pastor Chris is going to take the youth out, so you guys are dismissed. And everybody else, you can turn to uh, Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 2. Revelation, it's all the way to the right in, uh, in your Bible, or keep scrolling down if you're looking uh, electronically. Um, let's just pray as the kids go out, and let's just ask the Lord to really bless uh, his word uh, this morning. So, Father, we are so thankful to be gathered here together this morning, Lord, and just um, we do look forward, Lord, with a great sense of anticipation, Lord, expectation to what it is that you want to do supernaturally in our hearts, Lord, as we just set this time aside to you, Lord. We pray that your spirit would be our teacher this morning, Lord. We do pray for ears to hear what he would say to your church corporately, Lord, and uh, just for each of us personally. Father, speak to us, meet us where we are, we pray. And we ask your blessing on this time in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. So, controversial, right? Discussed and scrutinized, misunderstood, misinterpreted. These are all of these different words that have been applied to this book of Revelation. And yet my hope is that what we've seen in the last couple weeks in just the first chapter is that what we've seen is the opposite, right? What we've seen is that it's uh, the beginnings of a very orderly and an awesome revelation of the person of Jesus Christ, right? Our prophet, our priest, our king, the alpha, the omega, the almighty one. And what we've seen is a very different picture of Jesus, right, than most people picture today. Because the picture of Jesus in the Revelation is not one of that suffering Savior, but it's one of our exalted Lord as he is even now this morning in heaven. And as we move ahead together today, if you remember, we saw in just the last couple verses of our text last time, we said that the book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible that comes with a divine outline given to us by the author itself, given to us by Jesus himself. In verse 19, Jesus instructed John to write the things which you have seen, right? That was chapter 1, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Lord's person, right? Then he said to write the things which are. That's chapters 2 and 3. It's these letters to the church in which we said we're going to see a, 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 the whole scope of the history of the church all about the Lord's people, right? Then he said to write the things which will take place after this. So chapters 4 through 22, which are going to detail for us the things that are yet to come, the Lord's program. So we have the Lord's person, the Lord's people, and finally the Lord's 
program. And so this morning, we're going to start out looking at Jesus' words to his church in chapters 2 and 3. We're actually going to just look this morning at chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And we are actually going to spend the next several weeks in just these two chapters. And I know that so often there can be a tendency, and I I absolutely understand it, but we want to rush immediately and we want to jump to all of that incredible activity that happens in the supernatural, right? All those things that are recorded for us related to the great tribulation. You think about the seals and the trumpets and all of the bowl judgments and all of these incredible things that we're going to see. And yet, Jesus' seven letters to the seven churches that are recorded for us here in these two chapters are just as much a revelation of the Lord Jesus and specifically who he is and what it is that's important to him. The the letters actually are probably more important to us as Christians because we're not going to be here during the Great Tribulation. But here we have in these chapters this priceless revelation of the things that are important to Jesus in any and every local church, a church just like ours. Any church that calls itself a church of Jesus, right? Whether it's in our community or in the entire world. Now, we mentioned that Jesus selected these seven churches specifically out of what would probably have been hundreds at the time and many more in Asia Minor because he wanted to communicate a very specific message to his special people. And the study then of these two chapters is a very intriguing one. Because I think as we look at the Lord's word to these seven separate fellowships, each of the messages we're going to see has a fourfold application. Quickly, of course, they apply locally. Right? These were real letters written to real churches that really did exist in the first century. And they addressed real issues that were present in those churches. And yet not only are these words applicable to those specific churches locally, but they also apply, we could say, ecclesiastically. Right? They apply to the entire church. And they also serve as a a similar message to churches even now today. Certainly, there were other issues in these churches during John's time. And yet, the issues that are addressed by Jesus in these seven specific letters seem to cover, at least in his mind, kind of most all of the possible circumstances. It's as though Jesus specifically selected these seven churches to illustrate the different spiritual conditions that were possible and also present that would come in the church until he returns. And so again, it's going to give us some amazing insight into exactly how it is that Jesus estimates and then evaluates the local church. So they apply locally, right? They apply in a broader sense, ecclesiastically. But we're going to see that they also apply historically. Because as we work our way through these two very comprehensive chapters, what we're going to find is that the order of the seven churches amazingly follows the order of the various eras all throughout church history. Beginning in John's time, all the way up until what we're experiencing even now. And I know this may seem like a stretch to some, but remember this, in verse 20, as we finished up last time, remember that Jesus referred to the mystery, he said, of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So he tells us that there's some sort of a mystery that's somehow connected with these seven lampstands. Now, a mystery in the Bible isn't what we think of as a mystery. It's not necessarily something that's spooky or eerie. But a mystery in the Bible simply means something that was once concealed, but that is then revealed. 
Now, we know that the stands symbolize the seven churches in that region. We know that this whole section is going to deal with the things that are, right, in John's time. They must deal with the church. And so for centuries, students of the Bible have tried to unlock this mystery. And they tried first by applying this first part of church history with this first letter to the church, and they found kind of a match. And then they did it with the second, and they found another match, and so on and so on. Until what we will see by the time we get to the last letter, right, the letter to the lukewarm Laodiceans, we're going to see kind of a sobering truth that it describes exactly the conditions that we are seeing in our current church of today. So all you need to do is compare these seven letters to a book of church history, and you'll find that the pattern really fits perfectly. So the letters apply locally, they apply ecclesiastically, they also potentially apply historically, and yet this morning I hope that what we'll see is that they certainly, and they most importantly, they apply to each one of us as believers personally. Because again, if they apply to the entire church, the Christian church collectively is simply made up of what? It's made up of Christian individuals personally. So we're going to see that these individual exhortations to people or to groups in the churches, it makes it clear that it applies to all individual believers today because they're revealing the heart of Jesus for all of us as his church. So they have this sort of a rich application locally and ecclesiastically, historically, and personally. And I think that what we're going to find is that not only do they have this fourfold application, but each of the letters we're going to see follows the same kind of a four-part pattern. Jesus always is going to begin with an approval or a commendation for the things that the church is doing right except for one particular church, which is he couldn't find anything good to say. That's kind of a sad statement about that church, right? Then he's going to follow up the approval with an accusation or a rebuke for the things that they're doing wrong. And yet we're going to see that there are two churches that he can't find anything wrong with. So again, that speaks volumes to those churches. Then there's an admonition, right, an exhortation about how to correct the things that are wrong, and finally there's an assurance, right? A very encouraging promise to those who would take the words of Jesus to heart. And all of these things, we need to remember, all of these things come directly from the lips of our Lord, right? The head of the church, they give us such clear direction and the things that are important to him for us. And yet, and this is our last sort of introductory comment, What's so interesting and unfortunate is that this is a section of scripture that has been strangely neglected by the church as a whole. So often you'll see that you're, they're doing a series on the letters of Peter or a series on the letters of Paul or other portions of the New Testament and we're really diving into those for New, you know, New Testament church truth and yet usually it's these letters to the seven churches, though they came from Jesus himself, they often get completely ignored. And so for us, what I would like to do is we're gonna really take our time with them because I really want us to be able to glean from them. We're gonna take just one church each week for the next seven weeks, right? Unless the Lord returns, which would be even better news, amen? We're gonna start this week with lessons from the church at Ephesus. And they start out there in verse one with a reminder from Jesus. So look at verse one of Revelation chapter two. Jesus says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now those details should sound at least a bit familiar because they came right out of John's vision of Jesus that we looked at the last time. So Jesus introduces himself to this church and he uses this description of himself to remind them of something that they specifically were in danger of forgetting. And that's that Jesus is central to the church. 
He says there he walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Not only is he central to the church, but he has authority over the church, right? He holds those seven stars in his hand. And so the sense here, it's an encouraging one, first and foremost. It's the reminder of this wonderful reality that Jesus is always present in the midst of his people. Right, that he's here with us even now, even though not even all of us are here with us even now. Right? And yet he's in the midst of all of us, whether we're here in the sanctuary or there at home or driving in the car, wherever we are, Jesus is in our midst. And he's eager to bless and he's eager to minister. And yet even beyond that greatly encouraging sense, the idea of him walking here, in the original language, it means more so to walk specifically, to walk judiciously. So as he walks in the midst of Calvary Chapel Mountain View or any other church, that he weighs what we're doing here and he looks at it and he judges it, not in a, a condemning way, but he judges it to determine whether we are what we claim to be. Right? We claim to be about him. We claim to be representing him, that we're building upon him. And he is free then to come in and to assess whether what's happening in any local group of believers is really about him. To assess whether or not it really is about what he wants the church to be. So it's a, a healthy reminder of a very healthy reality, right, for us as a church corporately, but also for each one of us as individuals. Because just in the way that Jesus walks judiciously amongst the, the whole church, he also evaluates our lives in the same way. And there's a, a warning here that Jesus, in these words about himself, because somehow this church seems to be in danger of forgetting about the Lord. They need to be reminded that he's there in their midst, there in the church at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus, you can see on the map, it's the closest church to the island of Patmos, which would be just off the coast there, in this sort of an arc of cities. And as we mentioned last time, each of these letters we see here is addressed to an angel. Specifically here, it's the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now, before we get too mysterious here, that word angel most simply means messenger. Some of the more modern translations even translate it this way. Jesus himself uses it this way, the same word he uses to refer to John the Baptist in Matthew 11. He says, I say to you, he is more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So it's applied by Jesus to a human being who's carrying a message for God. Just in the same way that a, a pastor or a, a spiritual overseer carries a message for God to a local body of God's people. So most likely, most literally, most students understand these simply to be human messengers, right? Or the, the pastor, if you will, of the church. Although there are some who do prefer to think of it as some sort of angelic being who is somehow looking in on the workings of the church at Ephesus. Whatever you choose to believe, the point is that in some way, this angel, most importantly, represents the entire church. Because the, the letter isn't written just to a representative, but it's written to the whole of the church that was there in this city of Ephesus. Ephesus, of course, we remember, we just looked at it as we studied through Acts. Ephesus was a famous city in the ancient world. And it had this equally famous church that was planted there. You remember that Paul ministered there for three years. Aquila and Priscilla ministered there. Apollos ministered there. Timothy ministered there. Church tradition and history tells us that the apostle John himself ministered there. 
I love the way one author put it. He said that surely it was a place of great privilege and of great preaching. It was also a great commercial center. Remember, it was world famous as a religious and cultural and economic center of the entire region. As well, remember, it was definitely a center for wickedness and for immorality. Remember, it had that incredible temple to Diana, the fertility goddess who was worshipped through immoral sex acts. And this tremendous, tremendous temple to Diana in Ephesus, it was regarded at the time of one, as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. 127 pillars, each one with a, a statue on top of it, 60 feet tall. Remember we said that, that the one, this one structure was one and a half times the length of a football field and two times the width of a football field. The whole city of Ephesus, right, witchcraft, worship of this ancient pagan goddess, it was the focus for the entire city. So Ephesus was a picture of religious immorality at its worst. And yet it was in the midst of all of that, remember, that the Holy Spirit had begun this great work through Paul 40 years earlier and that work we're gonna see was still going strong because next Jesus now writes to them and he starts with his approval of them. Look at verse, um, starting off in verse two, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you've persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So Ephesus had a very active church with very high spiritual standards, right? They're very, very busy and busy about the things of the Lord. And you see from Jesus' words here, they worked hard, right? And they were laboring for the gospel. And the word that he uses there for labor means to labor to the point of exhaustion. So here you have this church, right? This group of men and women within the church who are serving the Lord to the point of fall into bed at the end of the day, exhaustion. That's the way that they were serving the Lord. They worked hard because the work in wicked Ephesus was hard. And they were very willing to do that work. And Jesus says to do it steadfastly, right? Patiently, persevering. And again, the sense of the language there, it's a steadfast kind of an endurance, right? The kind of, kind of keep on keeping on no matter what and doing it with a victorious attitude. No matter how much opposition came against them, overwhelmingly from all the persecution there that would have gone on in Ephesus, this is a very faithful church. I mean, here they are in the midst of this sexual immorality and idolatry and superstition and persecution, and they just stayed with the Lord. We couldn't possibly know anything about that, amen? But they did it, Jesus tells us. Look what he says next. They did it while they maintained holy lives, right? He says they did not put up with evil people. They were a pure people in the midst of a very impure environment in their city, right? Uninfluenced by all the ungodly culture. They didn't allow the culture to fashion them, but they maintained this real distinction as Christians in the midst of all this immorality and paganism, and they simply didn't tolerate evil in their church. Very different than the church there at Corinth. You remember them with the, the man that was sleeping with his stepmother, and the church thought they were so gracious and so woke because they just simply put up with it. And yet Paul says, hey, put up with it. I can judge that from where I am. You put that guy out of fellowship until he repents, and you remember that he did, and Paul said, bring him back into fellowship. They didn't tolerate that kind of thing in Ephesus. They judged evil according to the scriptures. They maintained a very strong 
scriptural perspective, no matter who it was that came in with some sort of new message. Notice again, Jesus commends them for exercising good discernment, right? They didn't listen to the false teachers. He said that they tested those who said they were apostles. Now, this was very common in the early church, and we're not talking about the 12 original apostles because the the role or the office of an apostle was broader than just the 12. Because in the early church, you had all of these people that were going along and kind of going around to all the churches saying that they had a message from the Lord. And yet here, when those people came into Ephesus, what they found is that their words were tested. Their words were weighed against the word of God to find out if that message really was from God. Remember what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. He said to test all things, right? to hold fast what is good. And then in, in Acts chapter 17, then when he moved on to Berea, Remember, he said that the Bereans were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They tested everything the, the apostle Paul himself was teaching them. And you remember that Paul wasn't at all offended by it. In fact, he was encouraged by it. And so again, Jesus commends this church because they're testing people according to the word of God. They were living holy lives. They were laboring tirelessly for the gospel. The work had been difficult, but they hadn't fainted. So in every way, this seemed to be a very successful church. Right? They had outreach. They had orthodoxy. They had holiness. And right about now you're thinking, what am I still doing here at this church, right? I've just found the perfect church. Let me know where I can find these people. And yet be very careful because there are a lot of churches even today that could fit this same description. Right? Very busy, bustling churches. They have full calendars. They have packed programs. They have these weary workers. And yet watch next because Jesus now continues following all of this great approval of their perseverance and their patience, now he has this one accusation against them, but it is a serious one. Look what he says in verse 4. He starts out by saying, nevertheless. Just that first word is a sobering one, right? Nevertheless. Because what it means is despite all of that, so Jesus was taking into account all of the good that was happening in the Ephesian church, and yet despite all of that, he had this one thing against them. And yet what we're going to see is the one thing is so serious that it threatens all of the rest of them. This one thing is so important to Jesus. We're going to see that if he was forced to choose between this one thing and all of the other things that they are, he would choose the one thing at the sacrifice of everything else. And of course, verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So the church at Ephesus had works and labor, patience, perseverance, holiness. They had doctrinal correctness, but they had left their first love for Jesus. Now notice... They had not ceased to love him. And he doesn't accuse them of that. But what he's concerned about here is that they have left behind a particular quality of their love for him. That they had left that love that they had for him at the time when they were first saved by him. The word first there in first love, it means first, or it means former, or it means in the beginning, that kind of love. And it refers specifically to kind of betrothal love, or spousal love, or what we would call newlywed love, or engagement love, or even going together kind of love. Remember that kind of love, the kind of love that can't 
wait to see one another again, the kind of love that rereads every text, right, or that re-listens to every voicemail, or reviews every post on Instagram. It's the kind of love, if you go far enough back in the day, the kind of love that used to write their name all over your book covers in school, or maybe even all over your peachy folders, right? On your jeans even, with all kinds of arrows and hearts and swirls. Now, don't pretend that some of us aren't old enough to remember doing that. Right? It's that kind of love that we first had when Jesus first rescued us from darkness. When he first showered us in his grace. That kind of love that we had when we suddenly realized that we were really in relationship with Jesus. You remember when we poured over every word in the word and the verses just jumped off the page at us for the very first time and we simply couldn't believe that everything that we were reading could possibly be true. We simply couldn't believe that it was true because we simply couldn't believe that he was that good. And then, as we learned that the Bible said that we were betrothed to him, we were engaged to him, that he considers us to be his bride. Right? What Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And this is language that the church of Ephesus would have well understood because remember, it was just 30 years earlier when Paul had written his own letter to them and he unlocked this mystery that human marriage is a picture of our own marriage to the Lord Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, he explains or he comments on Genesis chapter 2. He writes that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Right? It's too good to be true, but Jesus himself is the groom in this marriage relationship, and we as his church are the bride. It's wonderful, right? And yet what can happen to our love for the Lord in that relationship that we have with him over time is the very same thing that can happen to the love in a marriage over time, is that it simply becomes stale. It kind of becomes civil, right? Just sort of routine. And everybody is still very much doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they're doing it now almost bound more so by duty, right? Everybody's working hard in the marriage to kind of keep things going, but they have left that initial spark that got things going in the first place. And so here Jesus looks at this church. He looks at these precious people in the church, and he says that that's exactly what he sees, what he feels, and what he says when he sees them. And it is never what he wanted it to become. Understand this, that Jesus did not save us supremely because he needed a labor force. He didn't save us because he needed a, a secretary or an office manager or a theologian. Jesus saved us for relationship with him. And that's what means everything to him. All of these other things may mean a lot to him, and you see that he commended them for all of them, but they will never ever mean more to him than the relationship. And if in the lives of his people those other things are now considered what the relationship is, then Jesus is so faithful as a loving husband to come to that church or to come to that individual and to say, you know, you don't understand at all what's important to me. I'll take all of those other things in their proper place, but they will never be a replacement for what was. They will never be a replacement 
for you, for me having that place in your life. And that is what he is saying to this church. And maybe that's what he's even saying to you this morning, right? In the, in the quiet and the privacy of your own heart, right? Jesus is way more concerned about who he is to us personally and intimately. He's way more concerned about that than he ever was about what we can do for him. Now, historically, this church here at Ephesus represents this church of the apostolic times there in the first century because already they were starting to leave that first love for Jesus. Even at this time, just A.D. about 95 when this letter was written, the fire of that first love had begun to wane a bit. And we've seen when they began, they were fervent. Right? They went everywhere preaching the gospel, the, the love of Christ, the, the love they had for him, the love that they had for others wanting them to come to know him. That was driving them through the whole world, and yet now they were becoming a bit more established. They were leaving that first love. And we've watched it, right? This wonderful fervency of this church across the pages of the book of Acts. But remember, the book of Acts only covered about a 30-year period, taking us up to about A.D. 60. And now here, just 30 years later, that love was fading. And we see how quickly and how easily that fire can fade. And again, there may be some of us, you feel like the fire has faded. Maybe like the church at Ephesus here, you feel like there's a, a lot of fire going on, maybe on the outside. But in all honesty, there's not much more than a flicker of that same fire and that same passion on the inside. And yet, if that's you this morning, take heart. Because Jesus says what? He says he knows. He says he understands. And next, he's going to share with us, as he shares with this struggling church, he's going to give us the remedy for that situation. He now gives them a word of correction, right? There's an admonition to them. Look at verse 5. He says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So his counsel to them, right, or maybe to some of us who somehow, someday, maybe even today, we find ourselves in that very same spot, but his counsel can be summed up in three simple words, right? Remember, repent, and repeat, or redo, whichever you like the first works. Remember that initial love relationship that we had with Christ. Repent of our current heart attitude and then repeat those things which we did at first. Now, it is remarkably simple and yet it is so profoundly powerful and it is so effective. And what I want us to notice is that the key to the admonition here in verse 5 is actually found back in the accusation that we saw in verse 4. Notice again, Jesus was very careful to say that they had left their first love, not that they had what? Lost their first love. And there is a profound difference isn't there between the two because you would have no hope of being able to solve this situation if you had truly lost something if you leave something in a particular place then you know where it is and you know where to go to find it again but to lose that same item is something entirely different they hadn't lost their first love they had left their first love and what Jesus is explaining to them here, what he's explaining to us, is that it is still right there where you left it. And he also explained to us how to have it again. Right? Remember, repent, and repeat. Think back to that time when things were better, 
agree with the Lord that they were better, and then do those things that you were doing when they were better. Remember when your personal relationship with Jesus, that love you had when it was that newlywed kind of love. Remember that time with Jesus when the relationship with him meant more to you than everything else did. And then realize that you have fallen from that place. Notice that Jesus uses that word fallen here because it indicates that we have landed into something that's worse than what it was that we once had. Now, sometimes as Christians, we call it maturing in our faith. Right? We grow wiser. We grow a little bit more settled in our faith. And yet here, Jesus calls it fallen. We can be mature, but we can still be madly in love with him, just like when we first loved him. And Jesus says we can do it again just by doing what we used to, because he is not the one who changed. I love what my pastor would always say. I believe it's so very true. Pastor Dave would always say, you can take a million steps away from God, but it's only one step back. And that one step is simply to do again what we did at first. Right? It was those precious times of prayer and those intimate moments lingering in worship. Right? Those priceless sessions of Bible reading when we read chapters of the Bible at a time, not our devotions with a stopwatch, but we would read chapters of his word at a time, discovering for the very first time how much he loved us. Remember that initial expectation that we once had that he wanted to speak to us and that he was about to speak to us. Remember those edifying times of fellowship that we had with other believers or just the sheer excitement of the possibility of sharing Jesus with anyone who might listen to us because we wanted to share who he was and we wanted to share what he would, had done and we wanted to share the way that he loved us. And what Jesus is saying is go back to those basics, those very first things that we did when we first fell in love with him. It was those things that we did not because anyone told us that we had to or not just simply because we thought we should do them, but remember we did them because it was all that we could do. It was all that we wanted to do because these are the things that we never will outgrow. We'll never grow beyond those things. And yet, hasn't Satan done such a masterful job of creating kind of a sense of dissatisfaction with those first works? And what I mean by this is that you'll see so many Christians will be out running about after almost every new strange method or some new program for growth or to find peace, right? We have these shortened attention spans that make us just bored with the truest excitement that really only comes from that real relationship. And so often it seems that a Christian will do almost anything except do those first works again. And that's why I think it's so incredibly profound that Jesus promises that it is those first works, nothing more and nothing less, that's what will restore that first love. Wherever it is that you've fallen, simply do those things. And what's interesting is that what you find is that when a person has fallen away from that first love, and when they do reassess what it was that those first works really were, and then go back and make those same things priorities in their lives once again, what they discover is that that relationship is sitting right there where I once left it. And notice how clear Jesus is that the stakes are high here. 
right, there are severe consequences of them falling away, of this church not taking them seriously. He says, unless there's a radical change here, what's he going to do? He's going to remove their lampstand from its place. He's going to remove their lampstand from its place in his presence. He says, if this doesn't change, I'm going to remove the fullness of my presence from this local church. And when he does that, understand, all of the work will still go on and all of the efforts and the perseverance and the testing and all of that deep respect they had for the word, all those other things will still be going on. And yet everyone who comes in after that point is going to have this strange sense that all of these good things seem to be happening, but there seems to be something wrong here. There seems to be something missing in this church or in this person. Because it's not about, or this person is not about, what it is supposed to be supremely about, and that is a love relationship with the Lord Jesus himself. Right? We all know it personally. There's a dryness that comes into our lives. And there's a desperate need for the living water of his Holy Spirit and for his presence again. Right? That presence that only comes to us as we are directly connected intimately with him. And as we are enjoying that first love with him. And notice here in the midst of this admonition, Jesus adds one final word of approval that we're going to see is very related. Look at verse 6. He says, but this you have, he says, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, we don't know precisely what the deeds of the Nicolaitans were, but the word in the Greek comes from two different words. One means to conquer and one means the people. So to conquer the people. And the word Nicolaitans, it refers to the development of the priestly hierarchy within the church, right? The establishment of a, the clergy class. And what that did is it took the focus of the church off of Jesus and it put it on the church itself or more specifically, on the clergy. Now, we're going to deal with this more in depth when we get to the letter to the church at Pergamos, but for now, Jesus mentions it here to the Ephesians because here Jesus is fighting for the hearts of his own people, fighting for that place of first love in his heart, and he looks and he says, so now there's this religious system that's already developing within first century Christianity, and now they want to compete with me for first love in the hearts of my people. They're trying to set themselves up as mediators between my people and me. They want my people to become more connected to them rather than be connected directly with me. And it doesn't matter today whether we're talking about priests or whether we're talking about celebrity pastors or rock star worship leaders, any of these kinds of things, anything that comes between Jesus and his people and threatens that first love, Jesus looks at it and he condemns it because he hates it. And those are powerful words for Jesus to say that he hates something, right? This savior that is so rich in love. And yet it's coming between him and his people. And finally now to this, even this fallen church, Jesus has this final word of wonderful assurance for them. Look what it says in verse seven. He says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So Jesus reminds them of the reward that awaits those who have labored and have tested and who do persevere, but also who simply do it out of a love for him. That at the end of that kind of a life, that there's a great 
blessing and that there's a great reward. And Jesus makes this precious promise. Notice the words he uses there, to him who overcomes. Now, usually we think of overcoming in more dramatic terms of, you know, overcoming sin or overcoming obstacles or overcoming spiritual warfare, you know, these external things that we're dealing with. But here Jesus seems to be speaking of the overcoming of something that is so much deeper and that's so much more dangerous and so much more damaging, and that's the overcoming of the coldness of their own hearts. Overcoming of that lack of that first love. But even if that is you this morning, I want you to be encouraged. Because what Jesus is telling us is that it is possible for us to overcome. It is possible for us to be restored and to be refreshed. And it happens simply as we what? Remember, repent, and repeat those first works. And we allow him to restore that first love in him. Did you know that the word Ephesus, the name means darling? It means desirable. And it's what we are to him. And so this picture of the church at Ephesus is a picture of the church as it started, right? When the Lord held the church in his hand and when he directed by his spirit, he directed all of their ministry. He was at the center. His saints were gathered around him and they were working simply because of their love for him. So this letter, it's a call and it's permission really for us to stop striving in the flesh simply for the sake of appearances, and simply get back to our devotion to Jesus. And as I think about this letter, I think about Jesus in this letter and the supreme importance to him just of our love. And I almost wouldn't believe it if he didn't say it so explicitly. And the Lord I know consistently in my own walk with him when I've sometimes been prone to wander or so often when the work has become more important to me right? because of the pressures and the struggles and all of these things, but the work becomes more important than the relationship, right? Those times when I can be tempted to sacrifice the relationship or to sacrifice those times to cultivate that sense of intimacy in order to just get this thing done. But I think about just the ways that the Spirit has been so faithful to use this church and to use this letter just to remind me of what's really important to Jesus. What should be really important to me and then to just bring me back to that place. It's absolutely priceless. And I know that I'm not the only one. But to think about what Jesus has accomplished in all of God's people throughout all of the ages through these simple words here to the church at Ephesus. I am so thankful this morning, right, that this has been planted or maybe replanted in our hearts for the purpose that the Holy Spirit now can work within us if we'll simply, what, hear what he is saying to us to always be reminded, right, as hard as it can be to believe it, to always be reminded that it's our relationship with Jesus that's most important to him. He saved a bride, not a workforce. That relationship is everything to him. It's all he wants, our first love. It's all that he has ever wanted from us. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you for these precious promises that are given to us, Lord, by Jesus. We thank you for the way that this text just so clearly reveals the heart of Jesus. 
And Father, we just pray that our hearts would be open to those things that the Spirit is speaking to us even now, Lord. We pray that where there is repentance needed, Lord, we pray that we would do that, Lord. We pray that we would change our minds, Lord, that we would change our direction, change our attitude, our behavior, Lord, that we would turn back and repeat those things that we did at first, Lord, if there's, um, if there's a first love that we have left. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be open, Lord, as your spirit does that work now in our hearts. Begin it even now, Lord, we pray as we worship you. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.